Hello again. When there is a COVID-19 vaccine, how many people are going to refuse to take it? And does this mean we're going to lose herd immunity if they do? Linda Thunstrom of the University of Wyoming has the data. Hello, Linda. Hi, Tim. Now, where are we, remind me, in the vaccine development story? Yeah, so to the best of my knowledge, at present we have two vaccines um, that are that have advanced to phase three clinical trial, which means that they're now being tested on a larger group of people to see if, you know, if they're effective, if they are safe, and for how long. Um, people remain immune after having taken these vaccines. And then there is around 150 other vaccines, you know, different stages, but but these two would be the most advanced. And this is all about the concept of achieving herd immunity, isn't it? Uh, it remind me what herd immunity means. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so herd immunity is the um, state at which enough people in the population are immune, either from a vaccine or from having been infected by the virus, such that the pandemic burns out or dies out. We hear a lot about anti-vaxxers in the news, don't we? People who just won't take any vaccines. Uh, They get a lot of publicity, but uh, is this the only reason why people don't take vaccines? There are multiple reasons, actually, why people don't take vaccines. And um, it's very hard to categorize these people, you know, as as um, being a certain, you know, having certain characteristics, I, I, I should say. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, some people don't want to take vaccines because they have religious beliefs that, that go against vaccines. But those are actually pretty few. Um, more people, you know, have sort of rational reasons as well for not taking vaccines in terms of weighing the the benefits and risks to the vaccine. And then sometimes we might not have accurate beliefs about what those um, risks and benefits might be. But um, a lot of people are concerned about vaccine safety. And that is a particularly problematic in the current environment because we are rushing a vaccine for very good reasons, Um, but at the same time that adds adds fuel to the fire of people who are skeptical towards vaccines and vaccine safety in general. So it's going to be very important here to communicate that these vaccines are safe, even though they're developed in a very short amount of time. So to find out more about this, you did a, a survey asking people whether they would take a COVID vaccine and why they would or would not? What questions did you ask? So the main question was really, um, you know, would you, in the current um, situation, take a vaccine that is 60% effective um, in preventing you from becoming infected? Um, And, you know, there are different reasons why we post the question that way, but mainly, you know, we needed to communicate the effectiveness of the vaccine. We picked the most effective flu vaccine, um, that has been out there if, in a, during a really, really good flu vaccine season, we might get the vaccine to be 60% effective and then, you know, anything below that. Um, and also, it's hard to know what, this, what the risk situation is going to look like when the vaccine is, is here. So, so that was something that we varied. We varied different risk scenarios in our study to see, okay, well, what if this is the risk? What if that is the risk? You know, and, and then we try to get an, some sort of average of um, the willingness to take the vaccine across those risk scenarios. How can you be sure, because this is always a, a problem with surveys, isn't it, that what people say they are going to do matches what they actually would do? Yes, which is a great question. And we can't be sure. Uh, that's the short answer. Um, It gives us an idea, though. So typically, at least we have some correlation between the survey responses and what people will do in, in, you know, once they actually face the incentivized uh, question of whether or not they're going to take the vaccine. Um, But, you know, there are several, several factors here that that play in not only the hypothetical scenario that we're subjecting them to, but also that, again, you know, the risk situation can be different once the vaccine is here. 
Um, and there could be communications from politicians or others, you know, that will affect people's perception of, of the vaccine before it arrives and so on. Um, so I think the, the most important takeaway message from our survey is that there is a significant portion of the population, which is not unexpected given the anti-vax movement that you um, talked about earlier, and you know the general hesitancy towards vaccines in, in a fairly large share of the population. But you will see that that definitely spills over to the COVID-19 vaccine, and that that again then has an impact on our ability to, to achieve herd immunity uh, with the vaccine. So I suppose the most important influence on uptake is how strongly they perceive the risk of COVID. Is that right? Um, yes, it is. Um, there are other factors too, um, but the risk is, is going to be important. Um, the risk of the vaccine is also going to be important. So so again, doing that sort of individual benefit risk calculation and whether or not we do that accurately um, is a different question, but, but looking at the benefits from, uh, from becoming vaccinated by avoiding uh, COVID-19 versus the risk of, you know, that might be presented uh, from the vaccine. Um, so that, those are part of it. And then there's another, the underlying um, vaccine hesitancy as well that spills over in general that might be unrelated to the risks of COVID-19, but sort of, well, you know, I didn't take the flu shot um, in the last few years, you know, and I was just fine. And, um, and um, you know, I, I'm skeptical towards vaccines in general. And we also see impacts of, you know, um, religion. So if I have a stronger belief in God, um, I'm less likely to to take the vaccine so that again comes back to some of the religious reasons for for being um skeptical towards vaccines or avoiding vaccines even what about politics in all of this we have had what we could politely call mixed messages from politicians and also we live in a very polarized uh, political environment at the moment so how does that affect take up yeah that is problematic we we looked at that as well we um it's sort of ever since the start of this pandemic we've gotten mixed messages about the risks of of covid-19 in general um here in the us much of the risk messages have been um communicated by the white house um cdc to some extent but it's primarily been driven by the white house and um um we we know that the White House and perhaps especially the president has downplayed the risk of, um, of COVID-19. Um, and um, we looked at if that had an effect on, on people's actual behavior here, and it does. I mean, not only does it affect our risk perception, but it also affects our behavior in terms of, well, what we can measure as behavior here as intentions to vaccinate. So it has a significantly negative impact on our willingness to, to vaccinate when the White House downplays the risk of, um, of COVID-19. And that goes for both um, political parties, actually. So it, uh, we didn't see a difference there, which was a little surprising, between Republicans and Democrats. But it's enough, it seems like, having that alternate sort of risk scenario um, pushes even the Democrats who, who, who assign less trust than to the White House um to reduce their vaccine uptake now the interesting thing you did you you built a model with this looking at the risks of covid infection and also extending these results across the population uh does this what does this tell us about the effectiveness of a vaccine are we going to achieve herd immunity so with the most uh, established estimates of um, the parameters underlying the disease, um, we're probably not, uh, given vaccine hesitancy. And we are probably underestimating, you know, the uptake of the vaccine in our study for, for several reasons. I mean, first, we're assuming that the vaccine reaches everybody who wants to take a vaccine, which we know that that is an incredible logistical process, you know, in just manufacturing the vaccines and making sure that they get to every uh, that it gets to everybody. So um, the uptake is 
highly likely to be lower, um, not only because of vaccine avoidance, but because of the, the difficulties in distributing the vaccine. Um, second, we're assuming that the vaccine is entirely costless, uh, which also is not likely to be the case. Even if it's free in terms of, you know, there is no monetary cost associated with it, it's, it's going to be time consuming to get there or, you know, there's some, some cost, some opportunity cost associated with getting the vaccine. So, so even in the optimistic scenario of everybody who um, would be willing to take a free vaccine, taking it, um, you know, with the, we, we find that it is unlikely that the vaccine itself is going to generate herd immunity, which doesn't mean that we can't achieve it, but it's not going to be only with the help of the vaccine. Okay, then. So if you were the omnipotent policymaker and you had the power to do something that would increase the uptake, that would get us to herd immunity, what does the research tell us that policy might be? So um, I think, in a sense, the measles outbreaks that we've seen recently are helpful here. And that is you know, it, it, it just taught us something about how we can communicate uh, to local communities, you know, the, the importance of, of take, uptaking um, or taking the vaccine, sorry. Um, and that is going to be a, probably or most likely the most efficient strategy is going to be um, engaging local authorities, uh, family physicians in particular. Those are the most trusted sources of medical advice. So if we can get the family physicians, the school nurses and the local sort of caregivers um, on board with this strategy and starting working on it already now, um, that is going to be, you know, highly likely to help us in this case. Also, it's going to be very important to communicate that even though we are rushing this vaccine, it is safe. We've gone through all the, the um, standard protocols for vaccine development, even though you know, it, it's, it happens in a very short amount of time. So because the safety concerns are very real and seem to be dominating um, the choice not to, to take the vaccine, and novelty of vaccines hurts the, you know, the, the vaccine even further, and probably for that very same reason, we haven't observed any side effects yet. It seems that we're quite a long way from those policies at the moment, but we keep our fingers crossed. Uh, Linda, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. The paper we've been discussing is in COVID Economics 35. It's called Hesitancy Towards a COVID-19 Vaccine and Prospects for Herd Immunity. And the authors are Thunstrom, Ashworth, Finoff and Newbold. Well, keep in touch with all the COVID coverage at Vox EU and we'll see you soon.